Hi. Uh, before we begin, how are you doing? How are you feeling? <laughs> Much better, thank you. Okay. And do you feel um, well enough to do the conversation today? Or do Definitely. You wanna... Cool. No, I'm, I'm much better. Uh, very low cough. And most of the other side effects of, or symptoms, I should say, have subsided. Nice. Nice. It's always... Thanks for your patience. Yeah. Good to be on the other side. No worries. I mean, it's so uncomfortable. Um, so I'm glad that uh, the worst of it has passed. Cool. Thank well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, where are you located? Um, uh, well, right now I'm in my basement. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, over okay. on the East Coast. Nice. Um, cool. So, uh, yeah, once again, thanks for joining. Um, I just wanted to give you a bit of an intro around uh, who we are as an organization and also uh, just introduce myself a little bit as well. So um, we are uh, the podcast Future of Higher Education mm -hmm. is based out of the organization CCIR, which is the Cambridge Center for International Research. And basically we are an organization that um, gives high school students an opportunity to study, um, to conduct research projects with um, Oxbridge and Ivy League faculty. So uh, gotcha. yeah, so we have been doing, um, doing this for a few years and we have the opportunity to meet some really cool students uh, who are just very passionate about the subjects that they're interested in and oftentimes don't have the opportunity in high school to do that level of research. And so we right. give them the chance to, yeah. And um, naturally, you know, they end up having a lot of questions around admissions and um, things like that. So uh, they often ask us for advice, uh, but we um, are not necessarily the professionals for it. And that's why we came up with the idea of having conversations with people who do have a lot more insight into that field. So sure. yeah, so that is a little bit about who we are. And I give you a bit of an intro of myself, but yeah, I work with the um, CCIR team and um, I have a, a degree of, of experience, like a, some experience in the admission sort of space because uh, mm -hmm. I worked at the admission office for um, most of my university career um, when I was at Reed College. So mm -hmm. yeah, uh, it was really fun. And I also did sociology and um, almost wrote my thesis on college admissions and then decided not to at the end, <laughs> right before I wrote it. So um, I do, it is very interesting to me though. So uh, that's why uh, the team has asked me to conduct the interviews. Um, yeah, so to start off, um, do you want to give us a bit of an intro of yourself? And if you have any questions as well, feel free to, yeah, to ask those. Um, sure. Uh, well, I'll hold my questions until the end. Um, but uh, yeah, so a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Will Fenton. I've been in higher education uh, full-time since 2005. Um, when I graduated with my master's from the grad school of education at the University of Pennsylvania, um, I worked for approximately eight and a half years in university housing and residence life at Temple University uh, here in Philly. Um, <clears throat> uh, working with, um, starting with first year students, um, then going to mixed housing, which is first, uh, second year, and oftentimes uh, upperclassmen, um, and then moving on to the graduate housing space, uh, where I ran their graduate housing program for about four and a half years. Um, I then moved over into uh, admissions, um, working at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Engineering and Applied Science as assistant director for graduate admissions, um, where among other things, I helped them to kind of reformat um, and reform what that decision-making process and decision-making timeline really looked like. Um, I also helped them launch uh, the first computer uh, science, um, or was, um, computer technology is the name of the degree, of the first online uh, or fully online master's degree and for the Ivy League. Um, <clears throat> after that, I left and went to Drexel University, where I was the director of recruitment for the College of Engineering. I was there for um, about a year and a half. And um, I actually will be starting uh, tentatively as of next Thursday at Temple University's um, Fox School of Business as an associate director for graduate uh, admissions. Go oh, congrats. Owls. That's Thank very you. exciting. 
um, yeah, it's been it's been pushed back a little bit because of the whole uh, having COVID thing. Yeah. Um, but I'm uh, looking to uh, I'm very much looking forward to that change. Um, I've also been while I've been doing all this and working primarily the uh, graduate admission space. Um, I also started working this past spring with a company called um, Ingenious Prep, which is a uh, preparatory company that does preparation for both prospective undergraduate students and prospective graduate students, um, kind of advising them and guiding them through the whole application process. Um, so that's that's honestly where I've actually uh, had the most experience recently um, in regards to test optional policies. Um, and things along the lines of for undergraduate students uh, or for prospective undergraduate students, I should say. Um, but it's something I've always found really fascinating. I mean, the whole admissions thing, when I first got into it, it was because, hey, I needed a bit of a change from working in residence life for as many years as I did. Um, it's great, uh, but there are some stressors that you don't really get in other aspects of higher education. So it's like, let's see if, let's see if we can pivot here. Um, but once I actually got into it, I really became quite fascinated, um, one, by looking at what are the kind of things that schools are considering when they're admitting students, but also what does that process itself um, look like, and not just from the student perspective, then also from staff and faculty perspective and what they work with and what they go through as you're going through a kind of a quote unquote traditional admission cycle. Um, you know, do they get feedback from faculty in terms of how they shape their process? Do they get feedback from students in terms or prospective students in terms of what that looks like? Why it is that students make the decisions ultimately to enroll, to not enroll, even to apply or not apply, um, you know, as you do. And it's just, it's, it's something that I would, uh, I've already, I mean, if I were to ever go and pursue a PhD, it is definitely a thing, a thing that I think is, uh, would allow for quite fruitful type of research. There is, of course, constant research going on, especially in higher education all over the place. Um, but I think, especially in that admissions space, um, there is, uh, it could be a very fruitful research journey, if you will, because so much of it is, um, I think it's not well understood necessarily, but also it, it is at times shrouded in a bit of mystery, um, sometimes on purpose. Uh, and sometimes just because people, they don't necessarily understand it themselves all that well. Definitely, yeah. Um, there is, it is such an interesting space and it also just gets, um, it was already getting more and more complicated, you know, year by year and harder and more competitive and all of those things. And then I think especially in the past few years when COVID just turned everything around, um, it's really put a lot of, things into perspective, I think, for the, that specific sort of admission space. Mm -hmm. And I think left a lot of students even more at a loss of like what the correct direction or, or method is. Um, but that's very cool. I think uh, I do hope that you end up being able to do that for your PhD because it does sound like something um, that is very much worth researching. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Uh, we will see. I have toyed with that off and on for, um, I mean, I've been in higher ed for almost 20 years now. So I've toyed with that idea off and on for about the same amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. It's always, it's a maybe. It's a yeah. maybe. Yeah. No, that's how PhDs go. You just always start thinking maybe I should do this. So you're not yeah. wrong there. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. So I guess uh, you touched on it a, a little bit already, but. Um, what we're going to talk about today as our sort of like main topic, which we will um, hopefully, you know, discuss, you know, bigger, broader things is the change that has been happening in the admission space towards um, schools being test optional, but also test blind, test flexible, all of the different terms. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we already talked about COVID a little bit. There mm -hmm. it is obviously a change that occurred because COVID happened, um, but I, right. like in general, what are your thoughts around it? And maybe even like one step back, what are your thoughts around standardized testing for the undergraduate level? Uh, sure, well, I mean, that is of in itself uh, a whole fun <laughs> can of worms that we could open up. But I, I honestly, I think I'm probably not as equipped to open up that one. Uh, I would need a much bigger can opener. 
um, okay. than what I currently okay. have in terms of if I'm comparing my level of knowledge to a can opener, if you will. Um, <laughs> but in terms to kind of where we're at right now with all the varying test um, hyphen whatever policies and everything, I mean, it's something that um, has actually been a thing in the US uh, for almost 50 years now with where it kind of started. Um, as you mentioned, especially with COVID and with the shift to the online learning space and online test taking, um, there is a huge acceleration in schools moving to, um, at the minimum, a test optional um, admissions policy. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, there are also um, multiple different descriptors that schools use uh, for those policies. I was actually reading recently about one, um, Purdue University uh, in Indiana, for example. Um, they actually, and this, I hadn't heard this before, they are considered to be uh, test encouraged because they do not, exp or they explicitly say that if you um, submit test scores, um, it can uh, assist you in the process and that they encourage them to do that, but they don't require students to do that um, and that was I thought that was just like we really just are um, using a very fine tooth comb if you will in terms of uh, the the language that schools use when they're talking about these policies um, but to, to the original question uh, or the initial question I should say um, I think it's good that we're having more and more schools that are switching to a test optional policy I think there is a wide body of research that is at least um, majority, if you will, if not a definite consensus, um, that there are some very troubling dynamics um, when you're looking at those folks who tend to succeed um, on the ACT, SAT. Um, and if we're, if we're, you know, kind of lumping stuff in with that, with AP courses, um, with the IB courses, um, primarily, you know, we know that a lot of it has to do um, with economic level, which is especially, uh, you know, it's the way that we fund schools, especially public schools here in the US where that is so often tied to the property um, property tax levels of communities, which means, you know, higher property taxes, more funding for the schools. So those schools then can offer a lot more options uh, and which includes testing. Uh, it includes, um, you know, a lot more test prep stuff. It includes a lot more AP courses, um, so on and so forth. So if you don't have access to that stuff right off the bat, you're not going to be potentially able to do as well as folks who do. Doesn't mean that you can't, oh, you can go ahead and succeed, even if you live in a um, really downtrodden um, and you know, socioeconomically poor area. It just means it's going to probably be a lot harder, especially when we're starting to look at the large amounts of data that are available. So going test optional, um, if it's actually test optional, I think is a great thing for applicants. Um, I think where, you know, the flip side of that is, it does give one or multiple sets of data points. So it takes away from one or multiple sets of data points that schools have been using for uh, lots and lots of years to help make those admissions decisions. Um, the thing I'm honestly most, uh, I think, excited to see, going back to that, you know, talking about various types of research you can do, is going to be, and hopefully this is going to be done, um, you know, correctly by among others, I think the federal government needs to be doing this too, but is looking at um, four, eight, you know, 12 and so many years from now, is really taking a look at the folks who are coming in that are not submitting those test scores. And what are the ultimate outcomes that they have in the higher education space versus those folks who do? Um, there's a decent amount of, uh, of research, I think out there that shows, hey, People tend to do pretty much the same um, compared to if you don't submit test scores compared to those who do. But there is still so much, uh, I guess you'd say, noise within that, or so many variables within that. Um, it's are we looking at public schools? Are we looking at private schools? What's the size of the institution? Are we looking at um, what the majors are and what the programs are specifically? Like we're starting to drill down. Are we actually looking at the socioeconomic? Um, and potentially racial data within that as well. I mean, I know the, I think it's the ACT this summer stopped um, sharing their uh, the racial profiles on students who were taking the exams. Not for everybody is what they've said, 
Um, but you know, they're, they're only sharing it with specific groups now as opposed to just making it kind of a wildly available information, um, which that's like, well, okay, we're glad that you're controlling that data. But if you're controlling the data, um, then it's not necessarily available for everybody to take a look at and start doing the kind of stuff we just talking about is, you know, how are those folks doing? Um, so it, it comes back to the schools and hopefully people are going to be doing that kind of research. Um, and hopefully it shows that, yeah, the tests, um, you know, great uh, for certain things, but not necessarily in terms of will a student be successful in college or not. Yeah, that's so interesting about the ACT and um, keeping, like controlling the data. Uh, yeah, and I guess, because uh, I've, I've had this um, conversation with a few other sort of admission officer mm -hmm. background people, and uh, the conversation always goes to uh, if if we remove test scores from being required, then obviously the emphasis is going to be put on other things such as extracurriculars and this transcript and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And what I what I think is an interesting question is um, if the move to test optional, like part of the reason for it is to is to increase accessibility to students who are from lower socioeconomic backgrounds um, and to make it a bit of a more equal playing field, right? For those students, then will we, will we then find the same issue like coming up again in a few years time? If even if like all the schools went test optional or, you know, just didn't require them at all, um, wouldn't we see, uh, emphasis being put onto those other places and money being spent there basically instead. Cause I think, you know, we, everyone wants to, like, by being in education, like right. there is a desire to, um, to make things more equitable, but uh, the inequality is, is inevitable. And uh, yeah, so do you think that that is a potential change that will happen. And if so, like, do you, is it, I mean, it feels, it feels like it'll become the same problem just in a different form. Um, I mean, that's, that's a lot. And I appreciate all the ideas that you threw out there. Uh, I mean, I think there, there are a couple of different things that we could, um, we could pick and choose and probably discuss uh, for an hour, just that one topic. Um, I mean, I think that uh, what I would hope that you'd see that if there's, um, this movement to go test optional uh, continues and or, you know, say test blind, which is, it doesn't matter if you submit test scores or not, we're not looking at them. Um, hopefully schools will get a little better in terms of both being specific to the public about what they consider, which, I mean, I know there are definite institutions that uh, consider, um, you know, how they do admissions to be basically like proprietary technology, which mm -hmm. on one hand, I get it. You think that you have uh, the best system in place, and you want to make sure that that's your system. Okay, great. But if people need to know how to best apply for this, you know, for your school, I think it makes sense, and you have to let them know what that system looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, but in addition, and granted, I've only worked at uh, you know three institutions in higher ed. They're all in Philly, uh, and they're, they're pretty different to an extent, but you know, they all have um, some general characteristics. But uh, what I've found so far is that you know, every school kind of thinks, hey, what we do is the best way to do it. How we do it is, you know, it's better than everybody else's, which is never true because we have way too many schools uh, to think that every single school does it the best way. That's just the math just does not work out there. Um, but I say that to say that uh, what I would hope is that schools become a little bit more transparent with what that admissions process looks like. Um, but they also have to be, um, I think, far more intentional with the qualitative information that you are one collecting from your applicants, but also in terms of how you're using that information. Because I mean, test scores are one data point, but they're a very easy data point to use. Oh, people who got, you know, um, between a 1560 and a 1600 on the SAT. Uh, well, Great, if we got those, we could just say those folks are your automatics, um, unless there's some huge glaring, oh, uh, they may have also um, 
completely uh, plagiarize their uh, application essays. Well, all right, maybe, you know, we, we'll put them in the, in the middle tier there. Um, but it was really easy to just, that's one thing that we can separate them on. And because it is a national, well, I mean, international test, uh, really, um, that can be used or has been used as kind of a, um, a characteristic to just go across the board. So you can compare apples, oranges, kumquats, kiwis, but hey, if they all got at least a 1560, that's great. They go in the fruit baskets that's you know way over here that we're just gonna let into the school. You take that away, well, GPA is great. We already know that GPA is um, very wildly um, you know, across your range of, uh, of high schools and preparatory academies and things like that. Um, but then we also know that, well, what goes into the GPAs? Your classes, well, class quality. Uh, can vary a lot. Are we saying AP classes? Are we saying non-AP classes? Are we saying the IB classes? Um, all of a sudden, there's a lot more noise in that data that doesn't necessarily exist when you're talking a you know a nationalized uh, or an international type of exam. Um, and again, you know, I think the idea behind an ACT and SAT is sound because you want to hopefully be able to use some way you can compare folks that you want to bring in a very diverse and different pool great, we can use this as, as one data point. But because the preparation for all that varies wildly, just like the preparation for, or not preparation, but just like the education level um, of a high school in our country varies wildly. It really becomes difficult if all you're doing is looking at data, if all you're doing is looking at the numbers and you have to add in that qualitative element. Um, and ultimately you're gonna try and figure out and part of this is, is, of course, looking at that data, but you've got to try and figure out what is it that um, are some common denominators between students who tend to succeed at our institution. And to me, once you've figured that out, which hopefully you can do that, then you've got to let people know. Um, because not everybody is going to be successful at every school. And there's so many different factors that go into that, um, that if you don't have, uh, if you don't let people know, to me, you're honestly, you're wasting your time because you're looking at applications uh, that have no business whatsoever applying to your school and or would be absolutely miserable if they got in and came to your school. But you're also wasting the time of the applicants because they're not gonna, uh, you know, just the process itself is not great always. But um, if they even go and get in, it may actually turn out to be, well, this was a horrendous decision on their part as well. And if they had had, uh, more data and more information available to them, they may have been able to make that decision ahead of time to not apply versus, you know, applying and then turning out, oh, this is a really big mistake. Yeah, that is such a good point. And um, over, around, like across the schools that you worked for uh, in the admission space and over the years that you worked in the admission space in general, mm -hmm. do you feel that students are beginning, like applying students are beginning to recognize the fact that um, like there is this sort of idea of fit that needs to be sort of acknowledged. And it's not just about getting into like the best school be, uh, that you can get into, but that there is genuinely like a big question of do, will I fit into the school and will I be happy here? That needs to be answered. Um, yeah, I, I think that there is, um, although I'm, I'm not gonna lie, I'm probably a little biased in that. Um, I think fit, it was something that I was very blessed with. Um, my undergraduate university is Xavier University, Cincinnati, Ohio, small uh, private Jesuit school. Um, but it was literally, I walked on that campus and no more than let's say 10 minutes in, to just walking on the campus, I was like, I don't know what it is, man, but this is like, I just feel at home. I felt like this was the place that I was meant to go. And that's, I mean, that is fit. And not everybody, you know, the vast majority of students, uh, to my knowledge, don't usually get even an opportunity to go to the school they end up deciding to go to. Um, and it's, I mean, it's very much a qualitative, very much a specific a thing that is specific to an individual, what that fit looks like. But I do think, um, and I tell this with all the students that I work with, that you do need to take into consideration, not just what say the, the overall financial earning, you know, lifetime financial earnings of a graduate from a program or from your school are. That's definitely, a, that's definitely some information that it's good to think about. But um, 
if you don't consider, gee, do I like really, you know, am I okay taking classes that are going to have 100 or 200 people in them? Um, or do I want to be on a campus where, you know, 5,000 people is, that's the entire school. So that, um, well, we used to joke, because uh, at the time, Xavier was under, actually was under 5,000. I think, or I guess under 7,000 with grad students. But it was like um, back in the day when you print out pictures and tape them to your wall, um, you know, they, they, we joked that if you didn't, if you just met somebody, you go up to the dorm room um, and you'd probably see pictures on their wall, people that you knew because it was that small. That was, that was just a wonderful, a really great experience for me. But there are some folks who know they want to go and they want to be in a sea of 20,000 people any uh, day of the week, any time of day, just that's what they want to do. That's the kind of experience that they like to have. So that's something that you have to take in consideration. Uh, not only that, but what kind of weather do you want to live in? And this is something that I've um, I'm always been a, at least a little perplexed when I have conversations with people and they're just like, I hate like snow. And I was like, okay, snow is, not, is something that usually happens a few times a year in Philadelphia around the wintertime. I mean, you're, I know that you can look this up. I know this isn't something that is like, oh, every like six years, but now it'd probably be like every two, but you know, oh, we get like one, like 10 inch snow within a 24 hour period of time. No, that's not a, that is not a mysterious thing that may or may not occur in your lifetime. Um, but if you really, really hate snow, why are you, and you have the opportunity to go to a place, let's say um, Texas, which Occasionally, yes, does get a little bit of snow, but they're not getting 10 inches of snow at least once a winter. You know, why are you going to a place where you're going to spend four to five ish years? Um, where are you going to get a decent amount of snow? Yeah, you shouldn't be number one on the list. I mean, unless you really hate snow, but people oft, so often do not take that in consider consideration whatsoever. They're like, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to be in classes. I'm going to be, you know, studying and doing research and all this kind of stuff. It's like, yeah. But you're not doing that for 10 to 12 hours of your day. For the most part, some people definitely do that. Um, and that is awesome. Uh, but if you're not the kind of person who wants to stay in a classroom, wants to stay in a research lab for 12 hours out of your day, every single day of the year when school's in session and maybe even more hours when school's not in session, you need to take in consideration what does that, that weather and that environment look like? What is the size of the place that you're living? I mean, do you want to live in an urban city environment? Do you want to live out in the middle of cornfields? Is that just what you're like and more comfortable with? You know, do you want to be 15 minutes from nature in every direction, like big nature, like, you know, mountains and hiking and all that kind of fun stuff? Or are you like, no, honestly, I want to be able to step on a subway. I want to be able to go like to a downtown, to a very, uh, you know, hip happening area, uh, you know, restaurants and clubs, um, concert venues, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, that you want to be able to have really quick and easy access to. Because those are very much going to change what your actual experience is. Maybe not when you're, you know, an 18 and uh, year old student who's first stepping out of a college campus, but as you progress through your college career. And if, you know, two or three years in, you realize, God, you absolutely hate the place that you are. And it's going to affect your academics. It's going to affect you know, what your actual college career looks like. And we all, you know, it will then potentially also affect what happens after that. Um, I realized that was a little bit of a tangent. My apologies. I feel very strongly that people do need to take that kind of a fit and those other variables into consideration. And I, I just feel so often they don't. Yes. And I'm in complete agreement with you. I went to school in Portland, Oregon, where it rains like 10 months of the year so i mean no one it's a little, little exaggeration come on i've been to portland <laughs> i love portland uh no, let's say nine it's nine but it's, it is so nice in the summer but you do need to put up with a lot of rain and mm -hmm. i think a lot of my um yeah a lot of the students there uh well it's like a very popular yeah. out of state school so People were coming from the East Coast and stuff. And I think yeah. that environment was very specific and um, in just in terms of the weather. Uh, yeah. And I think like having had to do the rain thing for four years, like I really have realized how important it is to really think th through these things before mm -hmm. you commit. Um, and I feel like I personally think that um, 
when you are at the uh, when when you're at the level of um, or when you're like that young as a high school student thinking about what schools to go to and like you have pressure from a lot of different places and stuff like that um, that it's really hard to remember that you need to prioritize those things and I think there is like a lot of voices saying like you need to get into the best school like it doesn't matter if you know you like it or whatever it's like you have to end up going to that one so I hope that there is like a switch um, especially now that COVID has happened I think people have shifted priorities a little bit and I hope that people are considering those things a bit more you know it's, it's just way more important to be to be in the place where you feel um, actually happy and that should be the first priority but yeah I think um, going back into sort of the I guess just like what other changes you have witnessed in the past mm -hmm. few years in admissions um, what do you think the impact of COVID has been in the admission space outside of this test optional change or maybe like stemming off of that? Sure. <clears throat> well, um, you know, I think there, there are two things that I've at least witnessed. And again, um, you know, the caveat there is that most of my experience is more in the graduate admission space and in the undergrad. Although I think that definitely a few things at least that are very comparable. Um, I mean, the main thing is just is virtual recruitment. Um, that was already a thing, but uh, just like with virtual schooling, I mean, we knew it was a thing. There's a thing that some schools do. We knew that, uh, you know, a vast majority of states, <clears throat> excuse me, have at least, you know, a couple of quote unquote virtual charter schools that are on their rolls. Um, but actually uh, talking about that and maybe experiencing that once or twice, uh, you know, a year is a very different experience. Um, a specific example is that uh, in the year and a half plus that I was at Drexel, uh, we had, um, we went from, hmm, I want to say probably well, less than 20, let's say virtual events that we would do, uh, to nearly like, let's say 70 over the course of a year. Um, and it was specifically because like, well, we can't go anywhere. All right, great. But we still need to talk with students. We still need to meet with students where they are. Um, so we were able to do that um, through a, a variety of means. Um, and I think that that kind of stuff will definitely continue. I mean, if nothing else, if we're talking bottom line stuff, the return on investment is, to my knowledge at least, um, a heck of a lot greater because it just doesn't cost as much money for you and I to be sitting here talking you know, with this computer screen. Then it is, um, sorry, where, where are you located right now, actually? I'm actually in South Africa. I'm in Cape Town, ah. very far. Perfect example. <laughs> exactly, yeah. It costs a lot less money. It's also, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say it's probably a bit more environmentally friendly, among other things, for you and I to meet this way and talk about what, you know, what the school offerings might be and that kind of stuff, than it is for me to fly all the way to Cape Town, which I always wanted to go to, hopefully I will someday. I heard great things. Um, but yeah, you know, to get on a plane, to bring all my materials and whatnot, and then go, and you know what, at best, we might get to have like a 10 minute conversation at some, you know, large fair where you're like, oh, uh, Temple University. Yeah. And for whatever reason that you know Temple University, because there's a variety of reasons why people might know the name, just like with any other school. Um, but it's like, great, you have a 10 minute conversation and that was it. Um, and you're going to base your potentially huge life changing decision based on a 10 minute conversation. It was somebody who flew in, uh, was maybe a tad jet lag, depending on how much time I actually got to spend. In, I mean, it's just, it's so many things. So the virtual space that's opened up, I think is great. I think it will potentially allow, not only for a lot more recruitment opportunities, it's gonna allow um, prospective students to potentially interact with and have a lot more uh, conversations and a lot more in-depth conversation, hopefully with people about what that looks like. Um, you still run into the problem, you know, we're talking about with the fit piece earlier. You, that's always gonna be a thing because unless you actually get a chance to go, um, and step on that university and potentially be in the middle of a classroom space and all that kind of thing. You're just not going to know. But hopefully you can at least have for more conversations with people. Um, and because you can do that, it means you can also potentially open up um, those opportunities to a lot more people. So that's, I think that's another thing that I am, I'm hopeful to see. And I think in the U.S. especially, um, you know, the fact that we know uh, my current generation, if you will, we haven't had as many kids as my parents did which means the amount of people who are actually going uh, to be college eligible, if you will, 
is diminishing and going to continue to kind of go down and diminish it. Well, all right, great. So we want to have as many students as we currently have. How do we do that? We got to re recruit more. And we also have to potentially recruit more um, students internationally to be able to come. And that gives us, again, it's more opportunities um, to, be able to do that with that virtual space. Um, and then the other part of that, I think, is that you're going to see, again, because we no longer had this data point, uh, that was something that we could rely on. Again, now that we were relying on it, say, oh, if people who have a 1560 are getting in, they're going to be automatically be successful. That was never a thing that you could say 110%. Uh, but we could say, hey, um, we can use 1560. We think that's pretty good. It means they at least kind of know what they're doing for the most part. Um, we don't have, if we're not going to have that, great. We have to look at other information. It does mean, again, if we go back to the transparency piece I was talking about earlier, if schools are going to be more transparent about what they consider and how they consider that information, it would hopefully mean that students are a little bit uh, more clear eyed about what schools they're going to apply to. Um, it also hopefully means that um, they're going to be able to make potentially better decisions. And the thing that I love, hopefully, is that schools are going to um, be able to be a little bit more creative with how they offer financial aid. Because again, and this is, I, I don't know how schools are really doing this right now, um, but I do know that so many schools, those test scores, again, were a big factor in that merit aid piece. Well, okay, if you took that out, what does that merit aid um, look like going forward because we don't have those test scores to rely on. And you could say, well, anywhere with a 3.5 GPA, great. I went to a really small Catholic high school in Lima, Ohio, which is an itty bitty town in Northwest Ohio. I just say that to say that my 3.5 GPA may look a little bit different from somebody who went to school um, at South Philly High School, which is about a mile and a half down the road from where I live um, in South Philly. Um, it's a large urban school. Um, I actually worked there as a, uh, with an AmeriCorps program for a year when I first moved to Philadelphia. And it was probably, I think, 10 times the size of my high school. That's a surreal different type of experience that I had. So saying a 3.5 GPA from South Philadelphia High School is the same as a 3.5 GPA from Lima Central Catholic and itty bitty Lima, Ohio, where I had 90 people in my graduating class. No, that, but college folks, uh, admissions folks, will not tend to be smart enough to know that you can't compare those exactly the same. So how else do we go and look at that? Because at the end of the day, you do still, for the most part, have to make a choice is who you think is going to be able to be academically successful at your university, at your college, than those who may not necessarily be ready or be able to succeed. So yeah. how do we do that? Yeah, it sounds like the tests were playing quite a key role in just providing some sort of number that was like measurable um, across, across all of the different spaces. And uh, I guess I'm wondering now if there might be a new something that is able to, <laughs> and I know this is like kind of wild to say, but like a new something that will act as that like standardizing quantitative number um, that uh, that's that might replace, you know, what the purpose of these tests have been. Um, because we, everyone knows that the tests, although they exist, like, and are able, and you know, you can compare the numbers yeah. um, easily, it's still obviously not representative, right? And right. I know that different schools have different ways of um, looking at GPAs and like weighting them and, um, and all of that kind of stuff. But I'm wondering if some new thing will come, come up to like, be a measure of uh, to answer this question of just yeah. like, will a student be academically successful at our school? Um, yeah, and I don't know what that would look like, but yeah. Like yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a fascinating question. I think it's, it part of that is a, um, I'll probably generalize a little bit here, but I feel comfortable doing it. Um, it's that human desire to be able to point to say, hey, here's this one thing that if you can do that one thing, or if you can hit that one score, you're great. Um, test scores oftentimes do and have functioned 
as kind of one of those things. You know, again, I keep saying 1560, but I'm like, but that's a really good score, you know, on the SAT. If you get that 1560, you're probably going to be pretty, you know, good. Uh, your chances of getting into the vast majority of schools. Um, but you got to look at everything else. And I, I actually think, um, I mean, I think there's probably a whole host and there are people far smarter than me um, that are working on trying to figure out what does that formula look like? Um, but the flip side of that is that because every school thinks that they're the best at what it is they do, or if not the best, at we're top 10, um, then every school is going to have a slightly different way of doing that, which means there isn't going to necessarily be one number or one formula that every school can use because all the variables that go into whatever that formula might be are still going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, if, uh, so I know I use the example from my high school and then South Philly High School uh, that I taught, that I was a teaching assistant at for a year. Um, well, let's talk about, oh, you could say basketball players. I mean, there are thousands of metrics that are used to measure how successful somebody might be playing basketball. I mean, the folks who are in the NBA are top uh, of the top. I mean, they're that tippy top Mount Everest type of um, basketball athletes. But very few of them had the exact same type of experience getting to the point where they were able to be in the NBA and be successful. So they're measuring thousands of different data points. Um, and I'm a probably a bigger fan of a sport that I, you know, cannot actually affect whatsoever. I love to think that I can, um, you know, but in terms of the amount of data that they take in with wearables and things that measure their breath and their stops, their running speed, their stop, their jump. I mean, all these kinds of things, the angle of their shot. I mean, just like in baseball, where you measure um, what your launch angle is from when you hit a ball at how far, like how high it travels off the bat and that kind of stuff. So much data. It's just Avogadro's number of data. I recognize this is slightly, um, I forget what the phrase is. Anyways, COVID brain. Um, I say all that to say that there's so many data points and so much information that any school can choose to pull in to whatever this magical formula is to figure out if somebody's going to be able to be successful at their institution. Every single one is going to be a little bit unique because every institution is a little bit unique. Um, and there isn't one thing across the board that we can point at. So I, I get where you're coming from saying, listen, if we just have one thing, that we can all point to and say, hey, if you do X, we're good to go. Um, I actually am glad that we are going in what I think is a different direction from that. Um, again, I think schools are going to need to be more transparent than they have been with kind of what they look at and with um, what ultimately that holistic um, review point, you know, the holistic admissions, what makes that up. Um, but at the end of the day, it is about uh, people who are going to make a choice. Part of that is who chooses to apply to your institution um, and why. But part of that also is who are the folks who are making those decisions for your institution? And what information do they have um, about who is potentially going to be successful and who is not? And we also know that even if you're looking just at data, that there's so many other potential biases and whatever that, can, that could come into the picture. Um, so I think actually being, again, trying to be as transparent as you can about what you look at and what that admissions criteria is and how you go about making, especially the, looking at the qualitative stuff. Um, if you were class president for three years um, of your, uh, I mean, of your class versus somebody who was president of an engineering club and a uh, model UN, and which I think is still a thing. Um, and, um, oh, and then somebody else who uh, helped to create an app um, for people uh, that would read out websites um, because they are uh, they have vision difficulty. I mean, I've got to compare those three because they're three different people, but that is not something that you can just say, oh, well, all right, I'll give this one a one, this one a two, and this one a three. Yeah. Um, so it's how do you do that? That's yeah. that human element that that is really that, I, again, I think, I think schools need to be more transparent about what that kind of stuff looks like and how that kind of stuff factors in. Um, because it's, uh, at the end of the day, what you're doing is, I mean, you are making decisions about people's lived experience. And that is not something that is an easily quantifiable uh, piece of information. Definitely. 
And I guess considering that and, you know, for the students who are in the positions who need to position themselves correctly um, for these like schools that are all very unique that they are probably applying to. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, you have, you've already given so much great advice, but um, yeah, just to wrap it up, like what is some other just pointers or advice you would give to these students who, yeah, who are trying to figure it out? Sure. Um, I think, let's see, I'll try and limit this uh, to five, if I can do that. So we've talked, um, thinking about the school environment, um, not just the built environment itself, um, but the size of wherever, the, you know, the location, the size of what that location is, um, as well as, um, you know, nature, things like that, that are relatively, so literally the environment. <laughs> are there a lot of trees? Does it rain? A lot. Um, so that's number one. Um, I think the size of the school and the size of your program within that school, that definitely is something to take into consideration that you really do need to think about. Um, I do think you have to figure out, and it's hard when you're 17, 18, 19 years old. Um, I'm still working on this a little bit from time to time, but it's trying to figure out what is it that you want to do. And if you don't have a great idea, I was going to be um, an amazing advertising copywriter and work on like, make ads for Nike back in the day. I'm not doing that. Um, but if you don't have a really great clear idea of at least what you wanna try doing when you first get out, it's okay, but what do you like doing? What are subjects that, you know, that do make that, uh, you know, your eyes open wide, you get that sparkle, you know, you feel like, whoo, my mind has been expanded and I want to know so much more about this. What are those topics? They may not be the ones that are automatically going to uh, net you a $100,000 contract when you graduate um, to go work on Wall Street. Not everybody wants to do that. They also don't have that many jobs considering the amount of college graduates we get. So if you can't do that, what is it that you really are interested in? Um, and if you don't know, that's also okay. It's okay admitting that you don't know. Um, that, then it's, to me, it's look at, okay, what are some other ways that I can try and figure this out that aren't going to cost me eh, 30 to 50 plus thousand dollars a year um, just to try and figure that out? Because if you're going to college to figure out what type of program, what type of a degree that you want to get, um, I generally tell people to maybe take a step back and figure out if they really have no idea. I mean, just huge question mark. It's like, try and predict your future. I'm like, all I see is just a cloud. That's it. It's like, okay, great. So maybe we try and figure out what other ways there are to give that cloud a little bit more shape, a little bit more form. Uh, it could be taking some classes at a community college, which lots of times those credits are transfer um, you know, to varying colleges. Uh, not all the time, which is also a whole weird thing, but it's a different conversation. Um, but it also let you figure out, oh, gee, actually, I thought I wanted to do math. I took two high-level math courses, and I did horribly, and I hated every single second of it. Great. No longer going to try and apply to be a math major at whatever school is going to go to. Um, that is, you know, it's that trying piece. It's that trying to figure it out piece. Um, I think, let's say, I think it's three. Um, I think having conversation, like trying to talk to folks um, and maybe necessarily if you don't have um, siblings, if you're first gener potential first generation college and all that kind of stuff, you don't necessarily have the same options that you might if you have 85 family members, all who've gone to college. Um, I exaggerate there a little bit. Uh, but if you don't have that, great. So reach out, reach out to schools that you're potentially interested in. If you're not sure, great. So again, Go to like a local, if there's a junior college or community college, um, if there are local institutions around you. I mean, in Philly, in the Philadelphia area, we have just lots and lots and lots of schools. So see if you can go talk to somebody, see if you can uh, talk, and not just the admissions folks, we're great, yay, but also talk to students that are there. Find out what their stories are. Um, you know, see, because you actually may end up that they're the ones who actually are going to give you the best advice because they've potentially, especially for first-gen students, talk to some of their first-gen students. They've been in your shoes or the ones that you want to be in. Um, you know, how did they make their decisions? Uh, what does it look like? What, what did they consider when they were applying to, you know, the school, whatever the school might be? Um, that's four. Uh, let's go. With, so big, nice round number of five. Um, I think uh, 
taking a step back and uh, when you look at what you've accomplished or what you're currently in the middle of accomplishing as a, a high school student, um, as a person, all these things that you've done. Um, and I know this actually, if you're doing the common app, you know, they ask for your activities list. It's one of the main things you can do up to 10, I believe. Um, but it's making it, you don't necessarily have to be doing it for the college app, just do it in general. Look at what you've done and what you've accomplished, um, what you're hoping to accomplish. Excuse me, but really, if you're looking, all right, here's what I've done in the last however many years that I've been in from grade school on up. Take a step back once you've put this list together. Think, you know, you write it down, put it away, come back to it in like a day or a week or something like that. Try and look at this and it's like, all right, does this to me sound like a person who's going to go to X school in your mind? Um, do what you think that you've done, is it to an extent, not just impressive, you're like, look at all these things that I did, that's great. But you're trying to be able to take a step back from the fact that these are your personal experiences. And if you can share it with other people, definitely share it with other people. Ask you know, for them to give them you know, your, their opinions on what this looks like. Because what you're trying to do is figure out um, what does that potentially kind of shape what my future might look like, or how does that direct me to do something that I want to do? Um, because if the things that you've been doing are things that you actually, it turns out you're looking like, ah, I know those are nice, but I actually didn't enjoy any of them whatsoever. Great. So one, why were you doing all those things? Could be parents. You know, it could be, I want to make my resume look really great. That's awesome. Valid reasons, definitely. But if you didn't actually enjoy doing those things, if you didn't like them at all, one, it's going to be kind of hard to talk about um, about them in a positive way. When especially for schools that do interviews, they're going to ask you about these things, and it's going to come across if you did or didn't enjoy it. But even more so, then you've got to do a better job of figuring out what are the things that you will enjoy. Because the minute you step on that college campus, or shoot, even afterwards, at some point in time, you're the one who's making those decisions for yourself. You're not going off the advice of other people. Um, you're not doing things because your parents say, well, you've got to do X, Y, and Z because I said so, because I'm your parent. Um, what have you, you've got to be the making those decisions. And if you just spent 100, 150, 200, and the mind boggles when I say these large numbers, if you just spent that much money um, going to a school that you ultimately didn't just not like, but you're coming out with a piece of paper that says that you're an expert in whatever that degree is that you hate, that you want to have nothing to do with for hopefully the rest of your life, you might have made a little bit of a mistake. It's yeah. fixable, totally. I know quite a few people who went to law school that are not lawyers and have no desire to ever be a lawyer. That's great. But you may have been able to get that education and figure that kind of stuff out without having dropped $200,000 uh, that you're now potentially, you and or multiple family members and whatnot are now in debt for. And that is a huge consideration that at the end of the day, you got to think about. So it's, sorry, so that was a long-winded five, number five. But the number five is take a look at what you've done Think about what you want to do. How much of that is stuff that you really enjoy doing? And how much is that stuff you want to actually continue doing when you get into school? And if it is, great. Find the schools that are going to let you do that stuff. And if it's not, figure out what it is that you want to be able to try and do at the school that you're going to go to. Yeah. And then go to that school or at least apply. Yeah, that is um, incredible advice. I think number five, especially. <laughs> uh is applicable to I think anyone um not <laughs> just, yeah not just people um, applying to undergrad but I think yeah it's a it's a great it's a great way to kind of try and figure out what you want to do because I think people are way too often just doing things because they think they're supposed to and then mm -hmm. um I think it's inevitable that at some point whoever the whatever the pressure was that was like pushing you that way is going to step away because you're becoming older um and then I, yeah I mean I, I see people all the time just kind of feeling a bit lost because now they aren't sure why they're doing the thing that they work so hard to get into right. um yeah so that's really really great advice and looking at the things that you've done and then just 
forming an opinion around them, I feel like is also just so helpful. Something that I also have heard once is that, um, you know, you should look at your own experience as if you're just like reading someone else's resume and then just deciding how does this look, you know, because I think we get, um, I know I personally get very caught up in how, like, just like my own sort of thoughts around whatever I'm doing, but the objectivity is actually really valuable. And it sounds kind of similar to what you're describing. Yeah, uh, uh, very much so. I mean, I, I have someone who, if not early on in my whatever career, um, was very much like, okay, here's what I think. But I need to get other people's opinions or ask, you know, that for their ideas on that, because just because I think something is 110% of an awesome idea doesn't mean it necessarily is. Plus, um, and it's, I mean, it's just, it's learning because you're going to learn what other people's ideas or experiences have been as you go down that road. Uh, so you're like, hey, I was thinking I might do X for this. And they're like, oh, well, did you know that? These 35,000 people have all tried X and it didn't work out the way that you seem to think it would. Why do you think it's been any different? I'm like, I didn't know about that. Maybe I need to try something a little bit different. Maybe I just need to do a little more research. That's okay. Um, but you know, I mean, it's, shoot, not to get off on completely different tangent, but ecosystems are something that are very easy, especially where we're at as a country right now in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of writing saying that's kind of where people just live. And I don't know if I agree entirely with that, but I mean, when you go virtual and you're not actually going and having a lot of uh, interaction with folks day-to-day face-to-face type of stuff versus this, it is a little bit easier to just be like, hey, I talk to the folks that I want to talk to. I don't really expose myself to other ideas and opinions and that kind of stuff. Um, and when you're asking folks for their opinion on something that you've done or that you're thinking about doing, it automatically means not only you're going to get somebody else's idea, which is great, even if it is but it may open your eyes to something you never considered that you never thought about it's okay. a privilege to have the opportunity to do that um i think um, to be able to say wait let me think about this for a minute because i have the time and the space to step away and to think about things um but take advantage of that um because you said i mean we're not always going to have that opportunity to do that as you're and you're not going to have that external motivation it's got at some point it's got to come from in here it's that internal piece um, but exactly. getting people's feedback on that can be really helpful definitely yeah and uh i think anyone who listens to this will probably find this useful for their own lives hopefully but definitely um the students that will be listening to this as well uh yeah i get i guess we're gonna wrap it up now um well thank you so much for your time and especially making time, even though you are, you know, at the tail end of recovering from COVID, um, you have shared so many great insights and uh, have given our students so much good advice. And I'm, I'm sure that they're going to find it super helpful. Well, thank you very much, Katie. It's been a pleasure uh, to be here with you today and to get to participate in this conversation. Um, yeah. And, uh, and also thanks for the, you know, the well wishes on getting better. It's, it's so not fun. Um, and I mean, I've been, I've triple boosted. I've had the Paxlovid. Uh, yeah, if anyone's listening, if you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, please go do that. Because um, yes. I don't want to think about what it would have been like. I mean, I've heard, we've all read the horror stories or heard about American yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's no joke. Uh, but also, best of luck to everybody making their decision, however they're going to make that decision and applying for yeah. schools. Um, Definitely. Yeah, this has been so yeah. great. Yeah, and uh, have a great rest of your day. And um, yeah, when this when this episode is up and stuff, I will send it through to you so you can share it with uh, whoever whoever you want to share it with. Uh, yeah. But it will be on YouTube, and we'll also post a snippet or something on our Instagram page just to so the students can find it if that's cool. Yeah, uh, that's that's really great. I actually didn't know that we would also be on YouTube. Uh, that's oh. great. I'm glad I wore such a fun shirt. Um, <laughs> but yeah. uh yeah uh and i will say uh go temple <laughs> go temple next since I'm, I'm contractually obligated to do that of course <laughs> and on that note um thank have you a, so much you're yeah. welcome have I'll a great day you. bye